of our patients, uh, and that's because a lot of the patients required more than one discipline. And as you know, in a hospital environment, I'm sure many of you have tried to get in touch with me, it's not so easy, right? And even us getting in touch with each other, and sometimes we need to get in touch with three or four people, and sometimes we all need to be looking at the same thing at the same time in order to come to a decision. And as you'll see from today, there's not always one right decision. Sometimes these decisions in the care of patients are quite nuanced. So it takes everybody coming together, reviewing the pathology, reviewing the radiology, the case, special considerations to develop a good treatment plan. Now, tumor boards tend to be recurring, and they should be not a looking back, so to speak, but looking forward. So they should be done on a Usually, we do it weekly, some places do it monthly, but as the patient care is being provided, it's an ongoing thing. So we're going to present a few cases today, and uh, we have representatives from all the specialties, and this, this year we did something special, is that we included the patient perspective, because I've noticed that a lot of times we'll have recommendations from our tumor board, and of course you know who has veto power, right? Right, right, okay. So case number one. So uh, poor, poor Josh, he's, he's 53. In 2007. I wish. Well, we'll get back there one day. <laughs> In 2007, he had flushing and some pain. He went to his primary doctor. He had some imaging that showed a lesion in the right lower lobe of his lung. Afterwards, he had a right lower lobectomy and thoracic lymphadenectomy. Here's a picture of the lesion. And this was the pathology results. It was a typical lung carcinoid, two and a half centimeters in size, less than two mitoses per 10 high powered fields. KI67 is less than 5%. Synaptophys and comogranin was positive. Dr. Marchevsky, any thoughts? <coughs> Well, this is basically a, a low-grade uh, neuroendocrine uh, tumor. We use a uh, different terminology in different organs. In the lung, we like a uh, carcinoid. The tumor was uh, 2.5 centimeters in size, which uh, smaller than 3 centimeters is a lower uh, risk uh, category. We use a uh, mitosis, how fast the tumor is growing. And uh, there is a limit of 2 in 10 high-power fields. That is uh, good news. Higher than that makes it an atypical carcinoid. Tumors are known to have a little more aggressive behavior. So you have size is good, the number of mitosis is good, and then the KI67 is less than five, which is another cutoff for uh, good news versus not so less good news. The last two uh, features are immunostains that we use to determine that the tumor is neuroendocrine. So both were positive, which classify the tumor as a low-grade uh, neuroendocrine uh, neoplasm. Okay. Anyone have any uh, recommendations for this patient now that we're discussing in tumor board after surgery? Dr. Halperin, do, does this patient need any kind of treatment at this point? Uh, no. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, does anyone, does, it, does anyone want to venture as to what the surveillance plan should be for a patient like this? Do they just need a chest x-ray once in a while and we're good? Anyone have any thoughts? What do we have to do to, to check to see if the tumor is going to come back or not? Dr. Lee, do you have a plan for this patient? Yeah, so surveillance imaging, um, I think there's not complete consensus in terms of guidelines. So this is a relatively low-grade uh, neuroendocrine tumor where the risk of recurrence is still low, um, but there is still that risk of recurrence. So um, imaging can either be uh, CT of the chest imaging, um, 
usually about either three to six months uh, intervals uh, to see whether or not there's a recurrence moving forward. So the, this patient was told by the surgeon, you're good. This is done. Tumor's gone. You can maybe get a CT scan once in a while, you're in the clear. Giovanna, do you have any thoughts about this? This recommendation from the surgeon? Uh, on the one hand, I think as a patient, I'm gonna feel really good about that. Like, I wanna believe that. I, like, I'm cured. On the other hand, I'm maybe a little suspicious. Like, is it really true? Am I doing the right thing? Um, but if this is my first experience with being diagnosed with something really major, I'm probably going to believe the physician and just go with it because I really want to believe that I'm done. Yeah, it's a tough case. And then how long would, we, would you do surveillance for the medical oncologist? How long would you continue to check scans? Or surgeons, I know there's no thoracic surgeon here today, so I know it's a tough one. But you're a tumor surgeon, so maybe you can. How long would you do surveillance if you were going to do imaging? How long would it be done for? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the movement more recently, particularly with GI, but I think even if we look at sort of the way we've adjusted the NCCN guidelines over the last year or two has been to extend surveillance out, right? So, so I think we would typically say you may do the same number of scans, but over more years. So, you know, if you're doing them once a year, you may tend towards 10 years, I think. The data aren't quite clear on, particularly with low-risk patients, exactly when and where those recurrences will be, but 10 or for some folks even longer may be appropriate. Josh, how do you feel about all this? This is a tough problem. I feel good so far, but I've read online that I'm never really cured and that I should be getting imaging or some other follow-up more often, so I'm a little nervous about waiting six months, but, but I'll try. Understandable. So, so this gentleman, seven years later, I think the the idea that he had cancer even left his mind completely. He was found to have elevated liver enzymes, and an ultrasound showed liver lesions, and these were biopsies. So this is what an MRI at that time looks like. And here you see these these are the tumors, and then this is the liver, normal liver here. So you see it's, it's pretty large lesion. So not only is, he, is the patient, is Josh, shocked that it's come back, but it's also big. surprising, yeah. That's, that's um, concerning. And an Octria scan, this is in the olden days. Any radiology? Gabe, what do you think about, you can't see it. Not very impressive. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't look too good. But it's, it's pretty similar to how we do with Octria scans. It's just kind of like blurbs of light. Yeah. Anyways, so a biopsy was done. Dr. Marchevsky, what do you think about this biopsy result? <clears throat> well, again, the patient has a well-differentiated neuroendocrine uh, tumor. In this situation, you have to consider could it be a recurrence of the tumor from many years ago? or could the patient have a new uh, tumor, as the neuroendocrine tumors are known to be a multiple in some uh, people. So before you uh, make sure that this is a metastasis from the previous uh, tumor, it's a good idea to compare the two lesions, which in this situation is not going to help all that much because they all tend to look similar. But then clinically you have to make sure the patient doesn't have a carcinoid tumor elsewhere, particularly in the small uh, bowel that may benefit from uh, surgery before labeling this a metastatic uh, tumor from the lung into the liver. And Giovanna, as a patient, uh, how, how do you feel right now? I think right now I'm pretty frightened. Um, you know, I was told I was good, and here I am some years later, and I feel like I have really greatly metastatic cancer. Um, so I think one of the things that might cross my mind is, um, am I getting the best opinion that would come up? Yeah. So, how about you, Josh? Josh, how you feeling? Well, I'm, I'm trying to find out what the next treatment would be, <coughs> what my options are. Um, I'm probably not running around yet to find what else to do. I'm waiting to see what 
what comes back from the tumor board or from my oncologist. Okay, so does anyone from the surgical or interventional radiology have any perspectives on what they would recommend or medical oncology at this point? So a patient with recurrent lung neuroendocrine tumor well differentiated um, by low bar metastases to the liver seven years later. I think we would want to really discuss this kind of in this similar fashion in real life in terms of multidisciplinary team. Um, one of the questions that I would have for the surgeons as well as interventional radiologists is uh, the tumors appeared relatively bulky, uh, whether or not that's going to potentially compromise uh, venous outflow. Uh, the patient already has elevated liver function tests, um, so the, the concern is that if it potentially leads to venous outflow obstruction, uh, then that patient is in big trouble in terms of um, uh, their underlying disease with the liver, and they can go into impending liver failure as a result of that. Um, so that's, I think, question number one, because that will really determine how aggressive we might want to be with our systemic therapies going forward. We know that the patient will need some form of systemic therapy because we're not going to be able to completely clear the disease. Uh, but question number one would be for, uh, you know, the, the multidisciplinary team in that sense. Dr. Ganji, any thoughts? Our surgeon, um, if you haven't had a chance to meet her, she's our tumor surgeon specializing in her endocrine tumors. Go ahead. Um, so I apologize for my voice, but um, from the one cut we see he has pretty significant disease on the right lobe of the liver, and you're saying he has bilobar metastases with some evidence of liver compromise based on his elevated liver numbers. Uh, so I don't think he would be an optimal surgical candidate at this point. Um, I think there would be some option to potentially see if our IR colleagues can offer some embolization therapies to kind of control or decrease the tumor size, followed potentially by some systemic therapy, and then uh, reassess for potential resection depending on response. That's my liver function. Yeah, so I, I, I think there are several options for us uh, in the interventional radiology realm. These are too big for ablation, so we're, we're looking at the transarterial techniques. Um, and. Uh, you know, we'd also, there are elevated liver enzymes here, so we'd look at the, the liver enzymes and make sure that it was safe to treat, actually. Um, assuming that it is safe, um, you know, I think uh, uh, bland chemo or radiation, it's kind of dealer's choice here, um, are all, they're all viable options. So, Dr. Kassari knows what's happened. Um, so, <laughs> I think that one of the points that, that should be brought up is that, um, especially surgeons, I, first of all, I, I agree with uh, all the comments of my colleagues. Uh, surgeons are spatial, spatially oriented species. Uh, we, we like to see it. We like to have the information. So, if, if you get calls from our offices saying, hey, we really got to have the actual images, that's the reason why, because something that's in the report, um, most good surgeons will tell you they, they look at the images first, they make up their own mind about what's going on, and then they check to make sure that the radiologist read the film correctly. And when it comes to liver disease, for sure. So you got to see the images and see for yourself what is the distribution of disease, what are the chances of resection now, what are the chances of resection later, how can we bring in this multimodality treatment to hopefully get the patient to the point where something more can be done, if it can't be done like this is right now. Okay, great. And Dr. Halperin, if, if someone's recommended to have a, a, a large set of reductive surgery like this, <coughs> how would you consult the patient as far as the risk-benefit ratio of doing something like that? Yeah, I, um, this is really one of the things, sorry, like many things Giovanna says, like the, this was sort of true genius this morning when, when you said that really, you know, the calculation about quality of life and how much you're sort of buying with whatever sort of cost to yourself and your body you're willing to endure is so critical. Because, because the way I counsel my patients is, you know, when they see our, our surgeons, we tell them that if you follow sort of large surgical series long enough, almost everybody recurs eventually. And in fact, you know, many series will show you an average time to recurrence on the order of a couple of years for many folks. And so it becomes very much how much risk is there to the surgery, what anatomic considerations will there be, how much of a hit to your quality of life. Like you guys, my surgeons are phenomenal, so you know, the surgeons, we have very low morbidity and mortality, but what do you really get for that, even if it is just a week in the hospital or heaven forbid longer? Um, and, and how do we weigh that against the other 
treatment options we might have in light of knowing what the benefits of all those things might be. Great. So this patient did have a surgery. Um, as you can see here, it was um, removal of several confluent masses, microwave ablation, and alcohol ablation, and a lymph node dissection. So even within the techniques, there's sometimes multidisciplinary, right? So now the patient has been debulked uh, or cytoreduced. Anyone have any recommendations on what to do from here? So what sorry. should we do, tumor board? So I'm sorry, was, this was R2. Is that what we're saying? It was gross R2 debulking? Or they did they? Let's assume it's R2. Can you, can you explain what R2 means? So. Sorry, yeah, so, um, so, so the main question is, do we still have visible cancer that was left behind sort of deliberately? Uh, not deliberately, but because it was, it was not. <laughs> Forgive me. Because <laughs> it wasn't amenable to the many techniques that our, our colleagues had available at the time. Um, so let's say, that, let's say for the sake of our tumor board, there's, there's about a, a couple of small sub-centimeter lesions that you can see on post-surgical imaging. So there are two small lesions that you can see that they look like there's some residual left behind, which was expected. Yeah. No, I mean, I think as a, as a medical oncologist, you know, we're, we're aware that our systemic therapies have significant benefit for folks, right? We know that progression-free survival is significantly um, improved with the systemic agents we have. But we also know that in randomized trials, when patients cross over, everybody gets the benefit eventually. So a lot of times, if you're dealing with low volume indolent disease, we'll take that opportunity to understand if and when the disease is gonna grow before we start deploying the systemic therapies and really sort of try to maximize, because um, I think the lowest toxicity option you have is gonna be observation, um, other than the anxiety, which is worth, worth considering in that risk benefit balance. Um, and so we may try for that first. Josh, how do, you, how, how do you feel about all that? Do you feel like you're okay with waiting, or do you want to start treatment? So I hate the word waiting. Waiting's a bad word for most of the patients. Um, I didn't say anyone waiting. In, I said it. And you said observation. You said waiting. Um, I, I, I prefer learning and active that we're active in our, uh, in our disease care. I, I do understand, with enough explanation that you would give, that maybe we need to see what type of stripe this is, whether it would start um, going in whether we do some active surveillance um, and, and do some learning. There will be people who obviously won't be able to do that due to, you know, it's just too gut-wrenching to not be doing anything. Um, but I would understand that. I, I do have one question as being the patient. Was I ever allowed to be in my tumor board to listen to what happened and get the results of more than just what the final opinion is? That's been a big question it's, in our group. It's in the mezzanine. It's very hard to find. <laughs> <laughs> There's no parking. <laughs> and, and coffee isn't that great. Yeah, coffee is awful. Coffee's awful, but you know we're used to that. Um, so that's a great. That's a great question. Um, anyone on the board want to take? I, I can take that if anyone else. Uh, but anyone else, Dan, you want to say? Are patients allowed at your tumor board at City of Hope or? Um, I mean, patients are not traditionally, uh, you know, allowed in, in the tumor board because we present a lot of different cases uh, throughout the period. So it would be kind of privileged to other patient identifiers and patient information. Um, so what we do say is that, you know, we have a robust discussion and we do um, uh, kind of keep notes in terms of uh, what happened in the tumor board. Um, we're very open in terms of uh, how the case was discussed. So oftentimes for my patients, I, I do tell them that if there was discrepancies to, between different opinions, what are the uh, uh, different reasons why people had discrepancies um, so that we can really kind of weigh those risks and benefits uh, and make a uh, conscious uh, decision together. Uh, can I comment on that too, please? So um, anyone shop on Amazon? Have you ever spent like three hours looking up, you know, a different type of wallet that you want to buy? Yeah. Uh, it, it, the problem with information is that the more access to information you have, sometimes the harder it gets to try and interpret it correctly. Uh, it's not because we don't want you in the tumor board. Uh, it, it's, that information has to be digested by someone that you trust and be given to you in the way that it makes sense. I bet you if you sat through tumor board for your own case, 
you're not going to understand maybe um, you know, 30, 40 percent of sometimes the material that's being presented to you. And that's doing you a disservice. You, you shouldn't worry about the background stuff that goes out. You should find the right person, people that you trust and then get that information. Check it with other folks if you'd like to. But that's part of the reason. I haven't seen anyone include patients in tumor boards across the board. keep this moving along, I'm going to assume I don't have any symptoms and I'm okay, so I'll, I'll let it be um, active surveillance and you tell me how often I should come back. Yeah, that's so. Typically, for well-differentiated, low-grade disease, our surveillance imaging plan is about every six months. But of course, depends on the situation that might vary. So in April 2016, how long did you say, Dr. Halperin, the average amount of time was? <laughs> Around a couple years. Yeah, well, two years Please. later, um, there's some disease growth in the right lobe of the liver. So we'll go back to the tumor board. Can you see it? That, uh, let me just. Upper right hand corner. Yeah, it's actually, unfortunately, oh. the screen is probably kind of dark. We can see it pretty good here. The light. <laughs> <laughs> My selfie doesn't look very good. <laughs> Dr. Lipschitz, what do you think about that? Yeah, well, I mean, I would ask the surgeons if they want to resect again. We'd have to see the rest yeah, of the images. The images. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Those so, are all the images. I mean, assuming you that would, this... You would do a surgery again in two years? Yeah, I, I don't rule things out. I mean, you have to have the full data set, as much data as you can, but mm. repeat operations is doable. Uh, if, if yeah. this looks to be like in the right lobe of the liver towards the back and it's far enough away from the main vein that's draining the right side of the liver. So it is possible to go back in there and locally just excise that area. Okay. Any other ideas? I think the question with excision I would have there is he's had a pretty extensive surgery so I'd like to know what remnant liver he has and uh, what his liver function is, and it looks, I assume it's about under two centimeters or so. Um, so it's pretty central, and I think an ablation would be another option for a short interval recurrence in this patient. All right, so these are the options. How about Everolimus? Dr. Halper Ali, standard approved agent. Agreed. <laughs> that? Agreed. That's true. That's no, true. I think that I, I think the question in, in all of these situations is really, you know, what do we know about the biology of the sorry. It it's sort of what's at the confluence of the anatomy of the situation as was described, the biology of the cancer and the condition of the patient, right? And I think that the biology of the disease is telling us we just did the experiment that a local therapy is gonna give us a relatively short interval recurrence. And my question would be, are we sure we wanna bark up the same tree again, regardless of modality? IR surgery or, or alternative technique, personally. Okay, great. So this patient did receive embolization, then received everolimus and other therapies. But moving forward, we have a gallium-68 scan. Can you see that? So another two years pass? We're yeah, we can say another two years, about, about the time the gallium is approved in the U.S. So we have a gallium-68 scan. Dr. Thompson, do you have any feelings about this scan? Gallium-68 PET is a, a huge advantage over the octreotide because of the uh, brightness of the lesions when they show up compared to background and the fusion of the lesions with the anatomy so you can see where the heart is up the top and the liver and then the blob down the bottom is the bladder. Uh, it's always surprising to our patients to find gallium-68 PET showing up things that they didn't know they had, and uh, that's the problem with sharpening the lens and taking a look at the fine detail is you're using a different tool. It's a more sensitive tool for detection of small things, and uh, frequently it shows up things that you didn't know you had that were not evident on other imaging before. But sometimes that's really important to get a sense of the bigger picture of where the disease is rather than just focusing in on one organ. And how does that change our treatment algorithm? Now that a patient has progressive disease, the gallium scan is positive, but they have a lung tumor. Does any of the medical oncologists have a feeling of what you would recommend for this patient? It's not an easy one. Yeah, so this is a, you know, I think you're going to get 
you're probably being four, four different opinions if you see four different <laughs> medical oncologists. I, I'm being very maybe honest. Six yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah, probably six different <laughs> opinions. On. Uh, so at least off of your list here, uh, I think at a lot of major academic centers, uh, we do uh, encourage clinical trials. Um, the, the reason why is we understand that for uh, lung neuroendocrine tumors, there are um, limited FDA-approved treatment options. Uh, therefore, whenever we think about a clinical trial, we're really trying to give you another opportunity to see uh, a medication that you might not have otherwise, um, so that we give you as many possibilities in terms of many uh, chances to potentially respond to the various different types of treatments. Obviously, that does require um, kind of a similar mindset from the patient perspective and, and potential toxicities uh, incurred in the clinical trial. Uh, drug, but it's, um, you know, I think all of these are options, uh, but usually I would favor clinical trial in this case uh, over standard therapies. And, and I'll do a quick follow-up. Would it matter the fact that my lung primary is completely removed and it doesn't seem to be re-showing up? That isn't the area of recurrence, it's just my liver. Would that change some of the uh, mathematics to what you were thinking? Yeah, absolutely. So if it's just localized in one area, then uh, potentially local regional approaches might be more appropriate along with the same line of thought of being able to uh, have as many therapies still on the table as possible going forward. And can I just add, um, I think there's an important element here for the patient to understand how you are about information and decisions and how do you make decisions and how much information you feel you need. Like you said, I'm more the person who will be on Amazon for six hours looking for the wallet. Um, so I, get, I feel my comfort level is there to make a decision once I feel like I have enough information. Some people are just the opposite. They're like, no, I, I don't want to do the research, just tell me what to do. So it's important to know who you are in this process and what you need in terms of information or not having an overload of information. And that's individual. Okay, so the first case was a good example of we need everybody together to make decisions and come together. The next two cases are probably cases where you might not need all components of the multi-D team, okay? So this is a 53-year-old woman who presents with pel pelvic pain, uh, numbness in the left leg, and imaging that shows masses and lymph nodes in the belly causing these problems. The biopsy shows a poorly differentiated high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma. And here's some lymph nodes. Uh, this picture is better. Here are lymph nodes here surrounding this vascular structure. These are not normal lymph nodes. So for our medical oncology colleagues, how would you approach this problem? Chemotherapy, next question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Does it matter to you where it's coming from? Uh, so, so it actually, to some extent it does. Um, and, and that's only because I think that the, there's um, significant heterogeneity in sort of the biology of high-grade neuroendocrine neoplasms such that the uptake of that sort of frontline uh, atezolizumab immunotherapy incorporation that was discussed earlier uh, is is a little bit under under um, it's a little bit I won't say contentious but but debated in terms of whether it should be deployed outside or sort of with extra pulmonary high-grade neuroendocrine carcinomas so if you told me this person had a large lung mass with regional adenopathy from that which she didn't she, she doesn't um, they would see one of my lung doctor friends and and that person would get immunotherapy if they see one of the sort of extra pulmonary high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma people beyond that I would say no it's chemotherapy chemotherapy and chemotherapy and if we don't know if we don't, so it's, it's an excellent question, right? Because epidemiolo epidemiologically, we actually can see that uh, unknown primary high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma tracks exactly with small cell lung cancer of the lung. So as smoking went up and pulmonary high grades went up, extra pulmonary high grades went up, and then as smoking cessation took hold in, the popu in, in our population, and then the incidence of the cancer went down, so did unknown primary. So. Um, Interesting. I, yeah, it, it, it mirrors it beautifully. It's just an order of magnitude different. Giovanna, so, your, your yeah. medical oncologist is telling you it's chemo and that's it. Is that okay? Uh, 
next question. If that's, yeah. <laughs> that's what he said. <laughs> I like options, but this is, it's, it's, I would say not it's chemo or that's it. I would say it's chemo or we need to have a conversation about, about what it would mean not to do chemo. I think if I, you know, do my typical Amazon shopping information on Dr. Google that I'm going to probably see the same answers that chemo is going to be that answer. But would you send me out for any genomics testing? Just, I know that's later on this afternoon and you kind of explained why you might not, but would, uh, would, you, would you send me for a panel Dr. Lee? somewhere? Oh, Dr. Lee, would you do that? I, I mean, given the fact that we have limited treatment options, uh, I would uh, genomically profile the tumor um, on the off chance that there are a target approach. So. This is an but example when we don't talk to the so, surgeon. But <laughs> <laughs> I actually sure. have a question, a learning thing for me. I'm wondering if, if you guys do any repeat biopsies of this uh, with the heterogeneity that's there with KI67 uh, and a lot of the so that's a decision you made on that. Separate, uh, totally separate question, actually. Um, fascinating one, but totally separate. So, so first, though, uh, Dr. Lee's point, which is I absolutely agree, like genomic profiling, extremely reasonable, but do not wait. Right, it's yeah. go ahead and get it, but right. it has no relationship Something to what you're about Something actually afterwards. Today. Exactly, as jo it. yeah, exactly as you said, Josh. It's sort of, it's great down the line to know, and this is when you have tissue you may be able to send, um, but, but absolutely don't, don't wait for it. It's, it's the same chemo no matter what. I mean, this what. is a type of tumor where, you know, we, we always say normally for most neuroendocrine tumors, uh, it's not a sprint, but a marathon, right? But this is a high-grade, poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma. Um, so this is a time where we do have to sprint. Uh, so you do need to start treatment right away. So my patient, well, here, here's the molecular findings. So we did molecular findings. We started the patient on chemotherapy like you recommended. When it was discussed with the patient that we need to do chemotherapy, she said, no, I don't want to do that. And I said, you really? I said, everything you guys said, you know, that's it. That's what you got to do. And she's like, nope, 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 nope. We're going to do immune therapy. <laughs> and I said, please, let's just do chemo. Let's do chemo. So she agreed. We did, started the chemo, and then we got molecular testing. Um, and this is what the molecular testing showed. Anyone want to take a stab at this? Does this mean anything to the group? Some people would look at this and say, I don't know what this means. This doesn't mean anything to me. It's kind of complicated. Seeing the graphs. The graphs are much harder to read. <laughs> <laughs> this is common. So we get molecular findings, and a lot of times it's hard to interpret them, right? So I think as a patient, I look at this and I just want to know: Is there anything actionable? Right. I mean, is it's there? Yeah, it's, as, as a physician, I have exactly the same question. And, and, <laughs> yeah. and, what I, and what I honestly mean by that is, you know, are there prospective data that tell us that acting on one of these things for this person will yield benefit or harm? Um, and I think the answer really is, is no, um, as in terms of outside of an experimental setting. That being said, you know, as data are emerging, we may use this to influence among the various non-data driven or clinical trial options you know, that we would have. But in the standard realm, this to me is not actionable. Yeah, and, yeah. and this, is, this is a particularly tricky case because pdl one amplification is a pretty rare event and being discussed. And so this, this patient, she, she was like, I do not want to do chemo. And she kept telling me over and over again. And she pushed me. And so we enrolled her into the DART clinical trial. Um, which was a recent study that was actually showed positive results. So she was enrolled in Nevo IPI, and uh, she was on treatment for almost a year. She had some immune-related side effects, but otherwise she stopped, and her cancer hasn't grown for about two years now. And every day she comes, she brings me like um, a health juice, and she's like, Doc, let me take care of you. <laughs> if you ever need any medical advice, <laughs> I'm always available. <laughs> And uh, yeah, her, her disease is well controlled and almost gone without any treatment now. Well, and, and if I could just, just yeah, yeah, take please. a moment. So, um, so this, this illustrates actually a number of really fantastic points, right? One is, you know, yeah. sorry, it's a, it's a chronic issue with me. Um, so this illustrates really a couple of beautiful points, right? So one is, you know, 
how much you worked with your patient to decide together what the most appropriate thing for her was. And the fact that you were able to match her to a clinical study such that you were able to get her what she wanted and also make this not just some pretty pictures on the screen, but data that other people can learn from and hopefully benefit from. Because we know, right, it's a, DART is a small study. We don't really totally know, but the enthusiasm from that and the studies that will come from that to actually hopefully help other patients if right. this pans out is fantastic, right? And the fact that you know you and she were able to partner together to move this forward were just absolutely critical, and you're really both to be commended for it. I think personally. Thank you, honest, kind of you. Thank you. She should she should be commended. She's something else. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This isn't as easy one. Poor Josh. He comes back again to the clinic. I'm older. He's older now. <laughs> he's got. Aged. He's bleeding you now. <laughs> He's got blood in his urine. It's probably your prostate, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> and he gets a scan looking for kidney stones. And uh, they see a small lesion at the end of the pancreas. That's biopsy. And it's a well-differentiated, low-grade neuroendocrine tumor. In case anyone's interested, it's about 14 millimeters, which is, you know, not that big. Two more board, any thoughts, any plans? Surgeons? Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you know, surgeons will always say cut, of course. Um, well, w w will you in this case? <laughs> uh, with, with it's it's a great question, because size does matter in, in these situations, and also the, the patient. So the traditional thought is, two to three centimeters of a neuroendocrine tumor in the pancreas, so you could potentially wait and observe. Um, if you read um, some part of the literature say, even in that small of a tumor, there's 10 to 15% chance that there could be spread of disease elsewhere. So that's where it is a con somewhat controversial uh, issue that comes on the tumor board. Um, I think we can do this operation safely enough that if we have to operate, it really is just a simple decision to make from a technical standpoint. So a patient ha can tolerate general surgery. A lot of times we can do these minimally invasively, even if you have to have to, uh, an incision. It's, it's not the end of the world. Um, I'd have to know a little bit more about the patient themselves, um, but my inclination as I've gotten a little older is to become more and more aggressive in these kinds of situations. So I would recommend to take it out. Is that it? Final decision, I'm, or does I'm any? I'm 77. Yeah, so I I mean, Dr. Lee, Dr. Halpern, what? do you have a yeah, counterpoint? And I, and I have a 14 millimeter. Yeah, why? Why are you why bleeding? bleeding? What's wrong? What else is wrong? Well, yeah, what else is wrong with me? I got nothing. I got no symptoms. What, what about nope. metastatic disease? Are you certain there's no metastatic we're, disease? We're certain. The stage, gallium scan positive, no metastatic disease. That's it. That's that lesion. And we don't know the, the reason for his hematuria? Oh, that just prostate that something. Bad luck. Prostate. Know, it's, just, it's gone. Hematuria is resolved. This is it. This is the only problem. pickup. We, we thought we were looking at something else. I, I, we're very fortuitous. I, I know maybe. many people who are blind pickups who yeah. came in for something else, had an yeah. ultrasound, and they got diagnosed. So not a, it's not a trick case. Do you want to count? Mm -hmm. So I think Dr. Kosari hits all the important points, but I think this is a, a point at which I kind of really like to involve the patient in the decision making because it's a uh, there's data to suggest that you can observe these tumors that are smaller than two centimeters, and there's data to suggest that you should resect it. In a 75-year-old patient, I would say that the risk of surgery for a distal pancreas lesion or even a nucleation of that lesion is actually pretty low, because as Dr. Kosari mentioned, it's something that can be done minimally invasively. But there are certain risks associated with it. You can have pancreatic leaks. There's a risk of anesthesia. Um, and I would say that the other approach is that we could watch it with a short interval scan in three to six months. If it changes, you can still go in and do surgery because it's a well-differentiated tumor. <laughs> the likelihood of it growing very quickly would actually be pretty low. So um, I think this is a point at which I would really like to have the patient's opinion um, and kind of present them with all the facts. That would be my approach. Medical oncology, what do you guys yeah, think? I, I mean, I think it, it matters, um, obviously, what's been highlighted in terms of the tumor characteristics about resecting a small, um, you know, peanut. 
uh, that's well differentiated. But you know, I think the host characteristics also matter um, in, in, when we're talking about kind of personalized medicine and personalized approach and individualizing approach. Uh, host factors uh, play a big role for a 75 year old. Um, it's really important to gauge kind of not only their chronologic age, but necessarily their functional age. Is this uh, individual who's really, uh, from a functional standpoint, more of a 55-year-old, uh, or from a functional standpoint, potentially an 85-year-old? Uh, because that has significant differences in terms of your risk of uh, mortality on a yearly basis um, uh, from other conditions besides just uh, the underlying neuroendocrine tumor. So. Giovanna, as a patient, what do you think? These are the rec your, your doctor comes back and gives you these recommendations or these opinions. Well, well, how would you digest this? Information? I was going to pass this one to Josh. Okay, Josh. Okay. <laughs> Josh. So uh, honestly, I do get these calls actually asking what to do. Not that I, I just try to give out. And, and honestly, I had a 77-year-old recently with a small one who was actually told by his tumor board to go on Sandostatin. No, um, no history of any symptoms, just the blind pickup of something, and this was a 77-year-old who didn't want to do that at all. So he wanted to do a watch and learn, learn what was going to happen, have a shorter interval scan time. I'm not sure that's the majority of us, but there's some of us who, who will do that, and some of us who will want to either have listened to enough that said cut it out, and some who will say, I want some treatment and watch it. So I think it's hard to represent the entire patient uh, um, world here because I think all three of them would have been valid options and it really is personal preference. Um, so I'm not sure what you would do. It really is up to who you are and where you are in your life. Well, great. Yeah, so just as you might, we all have different levels and thresholds for information, we also have a threshold for, I don't care, get it out. When somebody who says, you know, I'm, what? Uh, what do you call it? What? Not not wait, but um, learn. Uh, learn. Learn. What, what, yeah. Watch and learn. 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 Love that. Um, and that's, that's okay. Well, great. Well, thank you for your help, the Tumor Board. This has been great. Tumor really Board needs it. to stay up. Oh, you, you need to stay up. You stay up. We're gonna do. Do you want to do five minutes of Q and A or ten minutes? I I have the uh, questions geared. I think we're gonna do a short Q and A round and then lunch and. For everybody, we are going to do an all-faculty photo, so if you're up here, stay up here. And um, we're also going to be talking about the lunchtime discussion tables. Some of the people you've met this morning, um, and just want to give a shout out. So Josh Mailman, you can read full bios in the program, but Josh is a patient, a PNET patient, and he leads the Northern California Support Group, which is a very, very strong group, NorCal Carcinet. Um, they also do monthly and annual programs. And Josh is also all over the world, uh, serving on many boards, you can read. So he's a very dedicated patient advocate, and we're happy to have him here. Um, also, just our visiting guests, Dr. Dan Halperin, um, who flew in to join us today um, for the Mayo Clinic. And Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Indiana. Um, no, MD, MD Anderson. Anderson. MD Anderson. It's a small okay. regional cancer I'm center. I'm so sorry. <laughs> never heard of it. It's totally fine. He covers the entire country. Yeah. <laughs> and Dr. Dan Lee from City of Hope, who many of you know, and uh, the rest of our illustrious panel are from Cedars. Dr. Louise Thompson is nuclear med here, and she will be giving a talk this afternoon on PRRT. Um, so at the lunchtime, if you look in your programs, there's 17 tables. You can choose the topic that you would like to address. Um, and in a moment, Andy's going to come up and we're going to give like a 30-second pitch for each table so you, to help you decide where you'd like to spend your lunchtime. Hey, so you guys have been actually, I also run Slideo um, for a couple different conferences, including this one. And uh, some of you have been doing questions. Those of you who are on the Facebook feed, we've tried to take your questions and join them in here. We have about 20 questions now that people have been looking through. I'm going to highlight some now that our illustrious board here can take a look at and we'll see what they do. And then we'll do some in the afternoon. Um, I think we answered this one or two of the surgeons, but um, 
you know, this is the follow-up. What, what do you do on the follow-up? Is once a year enough, or how do you determine it, and is this site-based um, and, and rece um, resection-based, how much they got? Any one of the surgeons want to take that one quickly? Sure. sure. So when it comes to small bowel, obviously the question is, how do we know it was all removed um, and the extent of it? Is that, is that the question? The first one? Yeah, they, they, they had the small bowel removed yeah. there. Currently, they had liver metastases, but they're stable on then reattired. They're getting that once a month. <clears throat> they're now being told to be followed up once with imaging once a year. Is that enough, or they're a little freaked out that it should be more often? Well, how, do you, how, how do you tell people between six months and a year, this is three years out and they're stable and with liver mets? So there's no uh, real consensus that we have in terms of how closely we should follow these people. What we typically tend to do is shortly after resection, we either follow them at three or six month intervals for a number of years, generally two to three years. And if the disease remains stable, then at that point we feel that it's sufficient to follow month, uh, once a year annually. So this is right in line. They were good for four years. We're, we're at yearly now. At this point, um, based on what we know. Uh, what did I do here? I just moved. Oh, I'm on, I'm on the wrong page because it did. Um, let's see. And this was also how do you tell if your primary was removed in surgery? How can you, um, uh, if you had a general surgeon, it, the word is R0, but if your surgeon doesn't tell you you're R0, what do you ask about? So uh, uh, it's really pathology reports that we look at, you know, when patients come to us for second opinions, if they've had surgery done at a community hospital, they presented with bowel obstruction somewhere else, and they were taken emergently to the operating room. So it's, what we look at is obviously the completeness of the surgery, and we look at margins uh, of the tumor uh, of the bowel that was resected, and more importantly, we look at lymph nodes, especially when it comes to small bowel, uh, to do that, uh, to look at the extent of surgery and that it was performed and everything was removed. And then we usually follow them with repeat imaging, at least at six months initially, uh, to make sure that there isn't um, any disease that was left behind, especially regional disease. So can I ask, so, because I'm curious, so um, when, when you see a patient who may have what you, what's an emergent and therefore oncologically maybe suboptimal resection, but they don't have any evidence of disease, they maybe had one lymph node out that was negative, do you re-explore folks or do you observe? So we, we usually observe. I, I would tell you I've had a couple that I've clinically followed for the same reason. Um, they were taken emergently to the operating room. The, these are done usually in the middle of the night. Sometimes there's not a pathologist available. So there's potential, you know, surgeon palpates this area of obstruction and they do a limited resection sometimes because they obviously don't know that it was cancer or if there is cancer or something else causing it. And sometimes only two lymph nodes are removed and then one may have had cancer in them and then what about the rest of them? So my tendency is to follow these patients clinically and do serial scans on them. And obviously, if at any point you start to see there's lymph nodes that are enlarged on the scans, then my threshold is low that I would take them back and re-explore them. Okay, I'm gonna highlight another question. Um, this is again about recurrence, that when cancer starts spreading from lymph nodes to lymph nodes, um, is there any generic or any pat answer that you give to people on what their options might be? Or is, again, this is a location-based question of, of where it was that their, their cancer is spreading from. Uh, give it to any oncologist on the, on the panel. I think it's an anatomic question. Okay, that's, that's fair enough. I, I, will, I, will, I will go down from, from that one. Um, uh, let's talk about biopsy since we have a pathologist on the, on the board as well here. No known primary, but increased uptake in specific areas on a net spot. Um, is a biopsy warranted? And when do you go back and re-biopsy? I guess that's one of the other questions is when do you go back to take a, a look at another biopsy? Dr. Thompson, maybe you want to take this. It, it's a little hard from the question to know what the background was that led to the net spot. I think the net spot positivity tells you that you have a disease with somatostatin receptor expression, which gives you a lot of information about what kind of disease you have, but it does not tell you 
uh, much about whether it's going to be well differentiated. I guess the net spot's more positive in well differentiated <coughs> disease than it would be in poorly differentiated disease. But I would say, uh, as an imaging doctor who doesn't order biopsies, if I was in this situation, I would want to know what the under the microscope looked like. And it wouldn't necessarily be the tail of the pancreas that needed to be biopsied. It could be one of the other lesions if it was more readily accessible. Can you depend on the net spot all the time for pancreas uptake? Is it always reliable? Uh, the, it's not recommended as the diagnostic tool for determining what the tumor is. If somebody presents and happens to have that as the first assessment, which is not usually the case. Usually the, the test is coming after we know what the diagnosis is likely to be. But no, it's not validated for determining what the true diagnosis is. And, and I know and, nuclear medicine will come up in the afternoon, but on the LACNET's um, information table, the uh, SNMI and NANETS came out with the appropriate use criteria for GAIM-68, and it will go through the criterias of what we consider when we should use these um, in practice. Dan, were you on this? No, not on that. Oh, right. I was. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you were about to. <laughs> no, sorry. Uh, go for it. You didn't you get were, that invitation, Josh. That was, that was bad. <laughs> no, I just. I think um, you know when you're when you're as as good as as Dr. Thompson is. Um, you might not end up in the situation that, that um, we do as medical oncologists sometimes where we find, you know, reports of outside scans where there's uptake and avidity in various places and we're asked to comment on, you know, whether this is definitely cancer or not, right? And I think actually the take home um, that you may be driving at is that just because something has somatostatin receptors does not mean it is a neuroendocrine tumor. And in fact, you know, in the tail of the spleen, excuse me, in the tail of the pancreas where you can see splenules and things, right. even in patients with active tumors, you can run into issues where you see sort of fake outs and false uptake that I believe uh, actually- I would call them artifacts. Artifacts. Um, but yes, the artifacts and of the imaging in the- exactly. um, Exactly. But they're, uh, they're the not art process of the pancreas right. would be. Right. And they're not, they're not necessarily, you know, artifactual. They're real. There's somatostatin receptors there. They're just not tumors. And, and that can get really, really delicate when we're, when we're dealing with questions like this in particular. So I'm going to, um, a lot of the questions that are remaining are either on genomics or nuclear medicine. I'm going to do um, uh, two more questions that are left on the board. One of them. Uh, the top two actually is we talked a little bit about quality of life when we had the uh, what to do with the patient, but also post-surgery and what types of things different centers offer for quality of life and, and navigation. So I don't know, as oncologists or as surgeons, do you, rec do you send people to these places or are there other ways they find out about these activities? Yeah, I mean, usually if, you, if you're having a Whipple surgery, it tends to be, if you're at a, at a you know, City of Hope, Cedars, MD Anderson, a major center, usually you have a team approach, so they'll have a lot of different subspecialty supportive services, whether it's palliative care, dietitian, social work. Uh, th these are a lot of different issues that require lots of different people, so I think that, that's the kind of thing that can happen that, that you should be able to get access to. And if you're in a smaller place, then you might have to cobble it together, but you should speak to dietitians social workers, what else we see? Maybe a palliative care physician in your community. And I know, not to make a plug for the lunchtime tables, but there are a lot of these that are going to be on the lunchtime table, so that's how you need to um, go about it. And if you can't cobble your own care, I know one of the speakers we had at our conference um, uh, a year ago was on palliative care, on putting things together, not that it's end of life care, but it's whole body care to make sure that the entire um, the entire U is looked after um, top to bottom. The last question that we'll do before we go to break and actually do the introductions for the table um, is uh, high-grade, well-differentiated nets. How is that um, much different? Because we, we're, now we're talking kind of the rare, the rares here. How is that different than some of the things we heard about earlier? So this is a rare entity. Um, based off of a pathologic marriage. classification that has um, been made Sorry, in terms of a well-differentiated grade three uh, pancreas neuroendocrine tumor. 
Um, so one of the things that's uh, fundamental here, I think, is you know what is the degree of expression in terms of the Ki67 proliferation index on pathology. Um, so that's one. Uh, if it's relatively high, then you might want to treat this uh, potentially with uh, aggressive systemic therapy approaches, more like a poorly differentiated high-grade tumor. Uh, the other. Uh, aspect of this is uh, does it express uh, somatostatin receptor uh, activity, uh, whether it's on uh, functional imaging with uh, gallium imaging or you can even uh, stain for SSTR on uh, pathology as well uh, because that might if you're a well differentiated G3 with Ki67, let's say around 25%, uh, and it's really more behaving like a G2 tumor uh, with some SN receptor activity, then you might be able to still treat it like a well differentiated, uh, G, more like a G2 type of tumor. Oh, yeah, no, I, sorry. No, no, please. Uh, one last word for Dan. Uh, Dr. Helprin, I'm sorry. You can have more than one word, though. <laughs> I'd have to pick it really carefully, Josh. No, I would just, what I would point out is that, you know, the, the rationale for splitting these into well-differentiated and poorly differentiated neuroendocrine neoplasms with grade three is to avoid sort of, in old days, we were shoehorned into managing patients with sort of with aggressive therapy that may have been out of proportion to the disease purely because of an elevated key 67. And I think of this as giving us a little bit more leeway as right. clinicians to have the opportunity to manage people more, more in sort of the well-differentiated vein. So it, it sort of separates out the data a little bit for you so you're not forced to do something that doesn't make sense for someone. Um, but it also means we really don't know specifically what to do. <laughs> but it also helps us, I mean, you mentioned a really perfect thing about the clinical trial and putting someone in and not excluding someone based on something. So this gives us a little better or different way to do this, or did we now, have we put too many, too many different piles out? Um, depends whether when the trial was written you could lump or split. Right, so, so I think one of the issues I've encountered over the last couple of years is this is a relatively new classification scheme and the life cycle of clinical trials is such that oftentimes ones that are active reflect the classification scheme of two years ago when they were designed. So I think now we're, we're getting into a realm of clinical trials where well-differentiated grade three integrations are eligible, but it's, um, it's unfortunately been rough going. So can, I'd like to add to that. Uh, we're, this is constantly evolving. It's very dynamic. So you'll hear some of these classifications are brand new. They just changed. And so what may happen with the patient is that they get a biopsy when they're diagnosed, and then maybe they have a surgery later on. And now they're all three. They're grade one, two, and three, because no. different tumors were biopsied, and now they're all of them. So it's not as simple as just putting everything into a box. And so that's really important, and we're all learning together about, well, what do we do? It, it shows grade three because it hit that cutoff of 20%, but it's acting like G2, and what, are, what else is going on with the patient? Are they symptomatic? Do they seem like they're more a G2-type patient? So it's important to realize how much research is going on behind the scenes, and thousands of people um, who are advancing this, and then we're all catching up, and that's why these amazing physicians are going to conferences and um, comparing notes with each other.